So if we have a quorum, I'd like to go ahead and get started. Um, so this is Blake's watershed session. My name is Supervisor Chuck Erickson. I'm District 13, which is near West Side, um, near downtown Madison. And um, I've done Lake Watershed Commission for probably 10 or 12 years, and just recently um, decided to act as chair, interim chair. Um, we've had a few people who have resigned and a few people who moved on to other positions. So we've been down on membership. So we've been trying to get some appointments made. I think we had another one this week that's happening. And um, we had another super down, a supervisor, we only had four supervisors. We had one supervisor who left to go work for the state. Um, so we're down a supervisor. We're hoping to get another supervisor soon. So we've had a lot of trouble getting quorum. And we're just trying to get back in the swing of things, so to speak, and get um, caught up. Um, so one issue that was important to me um, was uh, what we're hearing about with PFAS. Um, we've heard about it in the past. However, um, the inner committee had a presentation, and I wanted the Lakes Marshall Commission to have the same presentations. So that's um, what we're going to do tonight and, and here on. We have some other business that I'd like to take care of quickly uh, right before. And then, um, given I only have, um, I think, three speakers so far, maybe four, um, and if that's the case, then um, we'll have five minutes, so you can speak for five minutes. There's more, I'm still registering. Okay, yeah. so <laughs> if there's like three and two, that'll be at least five, and we'll have enough time for five minutes then each. Okay. Okay? The other <coughs> issue I just wanted to say was, again, this was, the purpose of this was informational for the Lakes and Watershed Commission. Um, we also have a county board meeting tonight, and one of my goals has always been, I've always said this, that I don't want Lakes Watershed Commission meetings to be on the same evening as a county board meeting. The reason we did this was because last week we didn't have a quorum, so we decided to postpone it a week. So we have to be, um, uh, we have to wrap up by 6.45 or so this evening, and we have a county board rule that if there are supervisors on a committee and there's a county board, that committee can no longer meet. The supervisors have to go to the county board. But I think we can get everybody in in enough time. And so with that, what I wanted to do was have everybody on the county, on, on the uh, Lakes Ownership Commission just briefly introduce yourselves. Again, I said my name is Supervisor Chuck Erickson, District 13, the Zoo, Monroe Street, Cole Center, sort of. Um, move on to Susan. Susan West, and I represent the Bain County Cities and Villages Association, and I'm on, I'm on the Middleton City Council. Thank you. I'm Lyle Updike. I'm the town chair for the town of Sun Prairie. I represent Bain County Towns, and uh, I've been on the commission for quite a while. Mm -hmm. Vice Chair. Uh, Maureen McCarville, I'm on the county board. I represent DeForest Windsor area. Um, been on the county board for four terms. Great. Dave Ripping. I represent the northwest corner of Dane County, 29th District. Um, been on the board a long time and make some letters a couple of times. I'm Carly Michaels. I was just appointed a couple of months ago by the mayor. And we also have two supervisors here who aren't on the Lakes and Watershed Commission but are concerned about this issue, so they're joining us as well. Yep, I'm Michelle Ritt. I'm not a member of the committee, and um, I represent the north side of Madison, District 18. And I'm Paul Rusk. I'm not on the committee, and I represent the north side of Madison that Michelle doesn't have. I'm Maria Moreno, and I've been on the Lakes and Watershed Commission for one term, and I represent the Queensland. I represent, wait, you represent who? Um, the county, you're the, I'm the Madison rep. Okay. So you represent the city of Madison. Okay, for Joe Percy, the county side. So, okay, sounds good. Um, I'm Kyle Meeks, I'm a watershed manager in the Dayton Land Alarm Resources Department and provide staff for the commission. John. Okay, great. Do we have any more staff here? Is that everybody? I think we covered everybody. Okay, so with that, I um, want to call the meeting to order. Um, then uh, I want to vote on the min minutes. So does anybody have any questions on the minutes? Or how do they look? Okay, is there a second? All in favor? Aye. That passes. We don't have any fund transfers, no referrals. We don't have any committee action. 
So if it's okay with the commission members, I want to quick go to G and have reports to committee. We'll get that very um, briefly updated on. And um, we just have a few things. That, Kyle, if you could go ahead on that. Yep, or no John is going to talk about something. Sure. So I'm just going to kind of run through the list. Down. The first one is kind of a lake levels update. Um, John can add more to this as, as if I'm missing anything or you just have more questions. Um, but the biggest one is that an RFP is being, putting, being put together uh, by the department to look at uh, a bid for equipment, and the type of equipment that we use for dredging of, of material. And so um, hopefully that RFP will be done in the end of January and then can go out for proposals. Um, there's also uh, staff recruitment because there are some new positions associated with that within the budget and recruitment for those positions will hopefully begin in February. Excellent, thank you. Yep. Number two, chlorides. Um, the chlorides initiative, uh, right now members <coughs> of uh, SaltWise are starting to get together including MMSD and the city of Madison to try to coordinate and find a way to potentially fill a LTE position to help in promoting and providing more trainings and outreach and support for that program. And that's probably the biggest Okay, that. terrific, great. And then the outreach report, I think we all got a copy of that. That's something that's been very important to us. We want to do outreach to the community overall, but particularly um, you know, people of color. Um, so if you just want to highlight that, or else you can know, yep. read that. I, th I think it's attached. If you have specific questions, feel free to reach out to Susan uh, Sanford or, or myself, and we can try to get those answered for you as well. And then two quick updates on the acre property and the foot property. Sure. So the acre property, um, demolition of the buildings is continuing. Um, hopefully those, there's uh, a training scheduled with the fire department and those will hopefully be um, burned and then... Uh, and that's the one that's north of Cousin Branch. Mm -hmm. That is correct. Okay. Yep. And then Cook property. And then uh, with the Cook property, uh, currently we're just, we expanded the riparian area around the wetlands that are already existing on that property and working with the landowner on updating kind of the conservation plan future plans for that property as well. Okay, terrific. So, go ahead. Well, I, another update. Uh, the Green Tier, the Clean Waters uh, yes. Green Tier Board met this morning, uh, and I represent the commission on that board. Basically, we had a tour of constru uh, construction sites in September. We had tabulated the results, and the Green Tier members we're about three to one acceptable versus unacceptable compared to non-members. So that the uh, initiatives of the Green Tier members have been substantially um, improved. And then an anecdote on the uh, SaltWise training, there was an article in the Sunbury local paper, the city of Sunbury has reduced their salt consumption by about $30,000, and they attributed that to lower distribution rates primarily because of the training of their staff uh, going to the salt ice training. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, just for their announcements. Okay. Um, let's see. Also, if you would just show up for future meetings um, dates. So my issues, like I said, I didn't want to have um, Lake Watershed Commission meetings on the Thursdays when we have county board. I think that that's what we've tried to do, right? I think yes. we largely succeeded. Yep. So that will give us enough time if we need it. So we won't run into the same situation right now. So you show that, everyone look at that, any questions, see Kyle. Okay. The only thing um, I, I want to say is that those meetings are scheduled to start at 5 p.m. instead of 5 p.m. Okay. All right. I'm sorry, say it again, 5 p.m. 5 p.m. Right. Okay. Yep. Um, okay, so the other thing I wanted to ask quickly, are there any more of the sheets to see? I just want to have a count of how many people we have. So. <coughs> okay, are there any more? I'm filling mine out. Okay, you want to sneak them? Okay. So that'll be... I think that we will have time so that we can go with five minutes then. Okay? So we're going to, um, next thing I'm going to go to though is items that are not on the agenda. And uh, I wanted to hear from Matthew. Yeah. Is that right? Yep. Yeah. So go ahead. You've got five minutes. Are you timing? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Hi. Um, uh, Chairman, uh, 
supervisor Eric and members of the supervisors uh, member, and members of the committee. Thank you. Uh, I'm here to present uh, uh, some work that I've done uh, regarding the uh, uh, soils of Hudson Park and how they're falling into Lake Monona and how they're providing a great source of phosphorus for Lake Monona. I went and I took a soil sample of the soil that was going to fall in and I got it analyzed and it had 750 parts per million total phosphorus. In. So if we kind of, every ton we keep out, we're keeping that phosphorus out and we don't have to build a big machine to do it if we just fix the land with uh, putting in grasses and sedges and, and shrubs. And so I, I'm presenting this uh, uh, copy uh, of the report. It has two pages of reading, uh, eight pages of photographs, and one page of soil test results. And I hope that it's uh, understandable. If not, please be feel, feel free to get a hold of me. Um, I'd like that this be uh, presented or given to staff so that they can start working on this issue with me. Um, because if we can start, as soon as we clean this up, it will stop losing phosphorus into our lake and we'll clean up. And we'll be able to see that. So, okay. I want to thank you very much. Yes, great. Thank, thank you. you. We appreciate it. Um, here, this will be here if you want to pass that around as well. Could we also got Could a staff email. attach it to the minutes? Yep, I'll attach it to the minutes. Okay. Yes. Yep. So we just got an email in there. Okay, the one thing I, okay. So the next thing I wanted to go to was the actual presentation. So we're going back to F, and I'm sorry, how long is that? <laughs> 10, 15 minutes, okay. That's 15 minutes, and we have approximately eight. I think we will still have time, so. And then I'll be presenting oh, probably, sorry. no, that's okay, probably about five minutes or so. Yeah. Okay, maybe just to make sure what and I want to do is, okay, we should cut it to four minutes just to make sure everybody gets to speak, okay? So, um, all right, so, Doug, why don't you go ahead? You're going to be up here. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's fine. As long as everybody can hear you, just speak loudly. Okay. Um, good evening. My name is Doug Figley. I'm the Director of Environmental Health with the uh, Public Health Department for Madison and Dane County. Um, tonight I'm going to just talk uh, briefly, give an overview of the uh, PFAS per and polyfluorinated alkalized substances. I just wanted to say something else quickly. Is this the presentation that you gave to Eater? Uh, there are changes. Okay. Uh, it is a little bit different because uh, as uh, studies and data okay. and everything comes in, um, right. I'm trying to keep it well, up. You had to give the presentation to ENER, which is the Environment Agriculture and Natural Resources Committee. Yes. Okay. Yep. Great. Thanks. Yep. Sorry to interrupt you. Yep. No problem. No problem. So I want to talk about uh, three different ways uh, that PFAS are impacting um, us here in Dane County. Um, surface water, groundwater, um, and then also our, our fish. That are in our lakes uh, here. So just really quickly, uh, a quick chemical lesson. PFAS are poly, per and polyfluorinated alkali substances. A structure is right up here. Um, this little head here changes, and it changes the uh, structure of the substances, um, as well as the chain of uh, 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 fluorines there will change as well, and it changes the structure of the, the PFAS. So there's, you'll hear people talk about eight chain, six chain, four chain, different, different size change, chains. Um, they were uh, produced uh, commercially, uh, started in the 40s, really ramped up in the 50s. Um, and then on here you can see peak production was from 70 to 2002. Mainly talking about two different uh, PFAS compounds here, PFOA and PFOS. There are over 3,000, um, but that actually has been 4,000 and it has been 5,000. So it's very easy to get more substances. You just change that head, put something on there, make the chain longer or shorter. So there's thousands and thousands of these compounds um, and can be more and more. Um, they're, they're, they're great. They're great compounds for fire resistance. They're great compounds for waterproofing. Uh, they're oil and stain uh, water resistant and everything. So they were used quite a bit They're in your Gore-Tex, Teflon, uh, different things like that used on a regular basis. The two compounds, PFOA and PFOS, are no longer uh, produced in the United States. Um, they were voluntarily banned, um, so we don't uh, see PFOA and PFOS so much anymore. 
but that doesn't mean that there's not still uh, PFAS substances out there. There are, and they are just um, um, uh, changing the name on them on, on a lot of times, and, and you may not think it's uh, a PFAS substance, but when you start looking at the longer name, it is a PFAS substance. So again, they're uh, used uh, predominantly nonstick coatings, waterproof fa fabrics, your uh, Gore-Tex, Scotch Guarding, all has uh, PFAS in it. Uh, food packaging, uh, that's what makes it uh, oil and grease resistant when you get that Big Mac that is not leaking on your lap or anything like that. Um, the specialty uh, firefighting foams, the aqueous, uh, it's called AFFF, aqueous firefighting foams. Again, that was uh, primarily used for oil and petroleum fires, and it just puts the foam over it, completely extinguishes the fire in a matter of seconds. Um, and then coated paper as well. So, um, as we uh, have all heard, um, if we've been reading the newspaper or anything recently, uh, these are called forever chemicals. They don't break down very easily. Um, and then some of the longer chain ones may break down, but they're just going to break down into the shorter chain uh, PFAS substances. Um, they're found at a lot of different sites, uh, mainly airports, uh, where there is training with uh, AFFF um, around military bases, um, etc. Um, and then they also do bioaccumulate. Uh, they bioaccumulate in fish and uh, wildlife. People. So the uh, primary ex uh, routes of exposure um, include uh, eating food that's packaged in PFAS uh, containing material, uh, eating the fish that are caught in waterways with uh, PFAS, um, drinking water that's contaminated with PFAS, and then uh, any incidental uh, ingest and ingestion of dust or soils with PFAS. Uh, a lot of that's more around the industrial areas where uh, there's a lot of PFAS coming out the stacks of, of companies and settling in that area. Um, again, and then in consumer products. So, um, it does collect in people. I think I heard that. <laughs> um, yeah, PFAS substances are found in probably, I think they figure like 98, 99% of us. So, most of us in here have PFAS in our blood serum. Um, the most of it is the PFOA, PFOS that's been measured. And, um, uh, fortunately, it has been uh, showing a, a decline in our serum over the past few years of those two substances. But again, remember, we're talking four or five thousand substances. So, health concerns. There are a lot of health concerns with PFAS. Um, causes uh, issues in the thyroid, uh, increased uh, cholesterol levels. It reduces the efficacy of vaccines, so we could be vaccinating, uh, and PFAS will reduce the uh, efficacy of those vaccines. And it's also been linked to decreased fertility in, in women. Um, a lot of the studies that have uh, looked at the health concerns of PFAS have been done on uh, animal studies, um, and only really, again, when we go back and look at the two substances, PFOA, PFOS, are the most studied and where we have the most information about the health concerns with, with PFAS. Again, we're talking 3,000 different substances, so um, there, there's still a ton of study to be done on all the substances that um, are still out there now. And it will take uh, years and years. So, some things that uh, we just got to keep in mind, they're widely used, stay in the body for a long time. There's a variety of uh, health risks that are associated with a high level of exposure. We're going to talk a little bit in here about Well 15, but right now at this point in time, Well 15 in the City of Madison is turned off. Um, the City of Madison has also done a lot of other testing in their wells and uh, has found it in uh, um, other wells uh, throughout the City of Madison. Um, some substances, a variety of different substances, depending on what well it was. So the Department of Health Services um, recently uh, sent the DNR um, the interim standards for PFOA, PFOS of uh, 20 parts per trillion. And they are also um, looking at 20 other substances that the DNR is asking DHS to look at. 
So DHS starts pulling all the uh, studies that they can together, um, and then they start reading through them, and then use uh, the, uh, their knowledge and the studies to help uh, come up with a standard that would work. Um, and they'll send that back to DNR, and then DNR starts the, uh, the rulemaking process, which I think I read today that they are starting the rulemaking process on the uh, PFOA and PFOS uh, interim guidance that was sent to DNR. Also, um, just recently, uh, actually last Wednesday, I think, excuse me, um, a new fish advisory came out for Lake Monona. Um, so hopefully, uh, we'll talk about it in a little bit here, but the, the fish advisory does change um, the amount of uh, fish meals that you can eat safely. So I just want to touch on some of the monitoring that uh, is happening. Um, I'm just going to talk here about uh, Madison Water Utility and the testing that was done in, in their wells. Um, it's, it's important here to note that the testing for PFAS started in, in 2012, um, but there is nothing found. They did another sample and test results in 2015 on all wells, and there was nothing found. ND means no detect. Down here, though, the reporting limit is 10 to 90 parts per trillion. What we find then in 2017 as the method changed, the reporting limit and the precision of the laboratories got much better. So now they can report down to two parts per trillion. Now we found it in uh, two wells in Madison. So then it was uh, checked again um, in 2018 and again was found in those two wells, 15 and 16. If I recall correctly, I think that we have PFAS substances that have been found in 10 out of 23 of the wells in the city of Madison. Um, and they are the ones that are, are doing the most testing. Um, we don't see a lot of testing coming from the other uh, public water systems at this point yet. And then this is just to uh, give you some idea of like the well 15 area where people will be drinking predominantly well 15 Water, um, I think it's in possibly your area uh, of supervision, um, but just uh, that uh, area there is the, the people that are getting most of the water from well 15. And again, well 15 is, is turned off. This is a very busy chart. It's got a lot of numbers and a lot of different things on it, but this is just uh, to show you that there are a lot of different standards throughout the United States. The one, where am I? I can't even see it now. The, do I have it on here? The, the um, uh, EPA guidance, the health advisory level for the EPA is 70 parts per trillion. Um, well 15 with all of the, uh, these five uh, PFAs is at 34. Um, and you can see some of the other levels in different states. New Hampshire just came out. These are changing and dropping quickly um, with different uh, states as they uh, are going through the rulemaking process and as they're finding more information out about PFAs. Um, here's where Wisconsin came in at 20 for uh, PFOA, PFOS. Uh, right now at well 15, uh, for those two substances, it's 12. So this is just to kind of show you that there's standards all over the board um, across the United States in terms of the uh, uh, PFAS and how they're being regulated. All right, I'm going to switch gears here a little bit and start talking about uh, fish sampling. Uh, fish sampling was done in October of last year, of 19. Uh, there was an attempt earlier on in the year, um, but the water levels were so high that the, uh, the uh, number of fish uh, couldn't be caught to get a good sample. Um, so they did another sample in uh, October and were able to get enough species. The, these are all the PFAS that were found in the fish, and 
right here, PFOS is the one that is used to base the uh, fish consumption advisory on. Uh, it is the one that accumulates the best in the fish and, and would be ha uh, found in the highest concentrations in the fish. Um, another thing I want to point out here too is when we're talking uh, PFAS, we're talking parts per trillion. These numbers here are in parts per billion. So just to kind of give you an idea, these have to be multiplied by 1,000 if we want to compare it to parts per trillion and parts per trillion. Um, and I'll show you some slides where we'll talk parts per trillion. I'll, I'll make sure that uh, you know that the, the standards that we were looking at before, so these are all in parts per trillion. So when we start taking these numbers, um, multiplying them by 1,000, we're talking some pretty high, uh, high levels of PFAS in the fish. The standards before for drinking water? The, in the chart before? So yeah, they were for, uh, these standards are for uh, groundwater. 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 Uh, which is different than drinking water, mm -hmm. which is different than surface water. So, so these are uh, in the tissue of fish. This is Starkweather Creek here. And then there is also results for Lake Monoma. So up here, uh, these are bluegills and largemouth bass. So again, these have to be multiplied by 1,000 to get parts per trillion. So again, some pretty uh, fairly high um, concentrations in our fish. Excuse me, Doug. Yes. Can you hear him OK? Yes. You're hearing him all right? Yes. Yeah. OK. Just want to okay. make sure. Yeah. All right. So um, based on the fish tissue uh, sampling and the results, the DNR changed the fish advisory for Lake Monona. Only for Lake Monona and Starkweather Creek, they called it a special advisory. So the special advisory, um, <laughs> it can get really complex and difficult. So to make it simple, this is really where we're looking at. One bluegill meal per week. For anybody, doesn't matter, women, men, uh, childbearing, child, anything, one bluegill meal per week. One meal of any other species per month, carp, catfish, uh, bass, um, northern, walleye, and perch. So there's other species that weren't tested, so it remains the same, because they weren't able to catch those species. So when there's additional sampling uh, done and other species are caught and analyzed and the results come back, they'll be added to either the one meal per week or the one uh, meal per month. Um, I'm just going to show this. This is what it looks like when you go to the actual DNR website to pull up the advisory for uh, Lake Monona. Um, and it's, it gets a little confusing but you can see it's still saying the same thing, one meal per week for bluegills. These are species that haven't been tested yet, so they're still allowed at one, one meal per week. Um, same thing. So they divide up uh, anywhere throughout the state. The advisory is, is broken up between women, uh, childbearing, and children under 15, and men, and, and older women. So that, that's how it, it breaks out. Um, it's not the, the easiest to understand. I think the easiest to understand is, is one meal of blue, blue bill a week than anything else, uh, one meal um, per month. And then this is just the same thing for uh, Starkweather Creek. So that's the new fish advisory. Um, it's changing. Uh, and then we'll be, uh, I'll talk a little bit later about how, we're, uh, how we adjust to that uh, as the public health department and as that county and city. I also want to just touch base on some surface sampling that was done. These uh, are all sites uh, that were sampled um, for PFAS, and the results are right here. This is, I, I tried to fit it all on the screen. These are the samples numbers, and these are the levels. They're in parts per trillion here. Um, so high, but not as high as in the fish which makes sense when you think about bioaccumulation. Where's 10? What's number 10? That's right by the... Right here. Okay. Is it that at Truex? Yeah. Oh, so I think um, this is Anderson right here. It's right here. 
It's where, <coughs> it's where MATC right. has their firefighting training facility. Yeah. It's just down. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, so these are the, these are the, the results uh, from the surface water sampling. Surface water, um, for our purposes, for public health purposes, really you can, you can swim and, and be in the water and everything. We just don't want people swallowing the water or anything like that. Or um, um, getting it, say, on their animals where their animals are licking it or anything. We just want to make sure that we're not ingesting the surface water. Boom. Um, I don't know if you can tell the difference here, but you can kind of see the difference between the colors here of a naturally occurring foam and a foam that is a PFAS foam. That's not correct, so, by the way. This, I'm a foamologist, and I checked it out. All right. I, I uh, get my information from uh, DHS. I so understand. That's, that's what I'm they're just telling uh, you, putting out. investigated it. So, um, the PFAS is a bright white uh, coloring, um, and it's usually lightweight and will blow uh, pretty pretty easily across um, the uh, the lake uh, or the stream if needed. Um, and it uh, can blow inland, and this will uh, accumulate more in the bays and the eddies, and will smell uh, differently than the uh, PFAS foam. Don't be smelling the foam. <laughs> All right, um, a couple things that I just want to point out here. Um, these are the current signs. Uh, we put these signs up uh, uh, per the DNR's uh, request to uh, just get the information out to people so that people are uh, aware of, of the uh, PFAS that is in the water in Starkweather Creek. Um, this here is the same sign at Obrick Park. This is a fish consumer advisory sign. Um, this is no longer valid because the advisory has changed. So these signs will need to come down. Um, these signs will also be replaced. These signs are saying we're waiting for the fish tissue results. We have those, so we'll make those adjustments um, and put new signs up um, around. Uh, we have 34 uh, spots along Starkweather Creek where we have signage. That's where we do most of our most of the signage, um, but we will. Um, take and expand our signage and make sure that we're hitting access points around all of uh, uh, Lake Monona um, and then we'll work with the city of Monona to ensure that we're getting the uh, access points in, in that area um, signed uh, properly. So the, the signage we, we do have to run by uh, DNR to get their approval. So. So this is how you can reduce exposure to PFAS. Avoid eating contaminated fish, which we know now that the fish in uh, Starkweather and Lake Monona are considered contaminated and the advisory has been adjusted. Uh, make sure that you're dusting and vacuuming your surfaces uh, properly. Limited eating food from treated paper and packaging products is very difficult for us to do that because everything we get is, is in some sort of a treated paper product. Um, and again, showering, washing dishes, or swimming in water um, isn't going to be uh, increase your exposure. It, it's not a very good, uh, dermal is not a very good route of exposure. So the next steps, uh, DNR is going to be pulling additional fish samples. Uh, they're going to pull from uh, uh, some more from Lake uh, Monona. Um, I think they're going to go into the Brigham Park area as well as uh, Lake Weaver. And uh, as I stated earlier, they started the process for uh, rulemaking on those two compounds, PFOA and PFOS. Uh, Department of Health Services is reviewing 20 additional PFAS at this point in time. So, so we'll have 22 out of 3,000 by December of 2020, which um, it's, uh, it, it, it's, there, there's been a, people su suggesting that we look at this as a class, but some of the compounds vary in toxicity. So it would be very difficult to look at it as a class. They're all bad. Um, community meetings uh, on fish consumption. Uh, we've got two meetings scheduled. I've got some handouts there, and we'll be uh, doing whatever we can to get the uh, information out to um, everybody um, on, the, um, on these meetings so that we can talk to people. We're particularly interested in uh, populations that are subsistence fishing. So we're doing our best to make sure we're outreaching those populations 
Um, and we will be sending out letters, um, postcards to advertise, to hopefully get uh, as many people as we can to these meetings so we can talk the uh, fish consumption. We have a website that uh, we're trying to collect and hold all of the information here. Um, and by all of the information, I mean from uh, the airport, from the DNR, from DHS, from um, um, the MMSD, another uh, player uh, in PFAS, um, and then as well as any uh, health information that we can. So we're trying to push everybody to this website um, so that all the information is out there and available for everybody. This uh, probably goes without saying. Additional studies are needed for PFAS overall. We have over 4,000 substances. Only two really have been studied to any extent. Um, and we need to have more uh, studies on these uh, compounds to actually know the impact on our health uh, as well as the impact on our lakes and our fish. Okay. Questions? Thank you, Doug. Sorry, I just want to fit in everybody who wants to speak, so I'm going to ask commissioners if you could email Doug your questions um, because we've got 12 people who want to speak so I want to get those people in um, and then your phone number is there, email address and then I want Amy you to speak um, if you could go up next um, and we'll wrap up with that then we'll have speakers. I just have a question about the presentation, should I ask that now or not? Can you email it? Oh, uh, sure. That'd be great. I'm sorry, Stone. That's all right. I just want to know how you yeah. feel. Sorry. Thanks. Thanks, Stone. Hi, everyone. I'm going to be speaking from NOAA tonight. Um, my name is Amy Tuffeiler. I'm an attorney with Dane County. Uh, I'm, in the, I'm an assistant corporation counsel, so I work here in the Dane County offices. My background includes environmental law. I have a master's degree in environmental studies from Madison. Um, and so I've, I have experience handling um, contaminated sites, and that's, that's how I got involved in this particular project. Um, tonight I want to give you some background about what's happening at the airport. Um, it's the start of a kind of a, a information, and um, I'll, as I'll explain at the end, um, we are going to continue to um, find ways to engage with public, the public. Um, at this point, I can tell you that in October of 2019, uh, DNR notified three parties that they believe are responsible for the contamination in Starkweather Creek. Those parties are Dane County, the City of Madison, and the Air National Guard. Um, also in October of 2019, DNR notified Dane County that it was liable <coughs> for PFAS levels detected in the Dane County Airport stormwater uh, system. So right now, the suspected source of PFAS in contamination in the area of the airport is the AFFF uh, firefighting <coughs> foam that uh, Doug mentioned. The Dane County Airport, you should know, contracts with the Air National Guard for its firefighting services. Therefore, at this point in time, the county has no reason to believe that county employees have handled the AFFF foam. The, um, also, with regard to some background that's helpful to know, the, uh, the Federal Aviation Administration, commonly known as the FAA, uh, re actually requires the airport to use firefighting services to use the AFFF foam in emergencies and for training. Um, the reason is because um, it works, it, it's excellent at putting out fires, and at this point, it's the best way to save lives. Um, that said, the FAA has set a, a three-year deadline for the federal government to come up with a replacement for PFAS foam. Um, so in other words, if we're, they're moving toward a firefighting foam that would be PFAS free. Right now, we're currently in year two of that three-year deadline. Um, so uh, the historically, the firefighting training occurred at the Truax Air National Guard base um, at the original <coughs> airport. And at this point in time, Air National Guard has advised the county that it's no longer conducting training at the Truax field and has moved those training activities to the Volk field in Juneau County. Um, thus, at this point in time, the only discharge of firefighting, PFAS firefighting foam we would expect at the airport would be in the event of an emergency, basically a fire. Uh, 
you know, turning back to the DNR um, directives, in the October notice, DNR set deadlines for the county and other responsible parties to take certain specific actions to proceed with the investigation of, of where the PFAS and Starkweather Creek is coming from. Um, Dane County has met all of its deadlines. At this stage of the process, the county has hired a consultant, which is Mead and Hunt, and you should understand they have um, a very in-depth knowledge of the county stormwater system. They also have, um, they're following uh, the PFAS developments at airports and remediations at a national level. Uh, so then in terms of what our deliverables are for, for the count, uh, for DNR, we were required to, in December, to submit a work plan for um, our next steps. And the plan that Mead and Hunt submitted on behalf of Dane County includes further sampling of the airport stormwater system, the goal of which is to determine uh, what the source of discharge coming into the stormwater system is. <coughs> And then additional investigation into the historic op airport operations that would be relevant to PFAS use. So we can do our best. This is like, um, you know, a remediation process is always wisely has to start with an investigation. We have to know, knowing that we have it in a creek is step one. Step two is to answer where is it coming from and how did it get there, basically. And, and with that goal in mind, you're going to look for, you know, where, where the hot amounts are highest, basically. It's a system of prioritizing um, where, the, where the risks are greatest. Now, since the consultants have submitted that report, as I mentioned, it was in December, we now have um, this new sampling results from DNR in Starkweather Creek, which came out in January, January 15th. So the county's consultant is now in the process of revising the work plan um, and to factor in this new information, the new data, into their investigation process. Uh, what I can tell you, and it's, can, I'm sure frustrating to hear, but the process of an investigation has to occur in steps. So what will happen is at each step of the sampling, um, the consultants will be able to further define where the PFAS is located, and ultimately the goal is to identify where in the ground it is coming from. In other words, what's the source? Um, understanding that the, what, where the PFAS originates on the property is going to be an essential part um, to, to, to making wise decisions about how to remediate it going forward. Um, what also, the other thing I can tell you today is that the county has been working with the other responsible parties to install and update the signage that Doug spoke about um, and provide um, uh, fish advisories and then letters to impacted residents. In addition, we are in the process of developing a web page for the airport um, investigation process that will likely be linked to the um, uh, public health website. Um, that, that, that's in process. Also, um, we, now that we've, we've got um, the planning underway, once we have the updated um, uh, sampling plan, then at that point we'll schedule a, uh, we'll definitely schedule an informational meeting, public informational meeting to to give you an update on what's happening. And, and the, I, I expect that the web page will ultimately include all the reports that are um, submitted to DNR and, and some additional background information. Okay. And do you have any idea of approximately when that meeting will be? Um, at this point, I would estimate about mid-March. What has to happen is um, the, we have to, our consultant has to submit the plan, right. and then DNR has to approve it. And then once we have a sense, and there might be some in my experience, there tends to be a little bit of refining that happens, so okay. mid-March would be fair. Mid-March of 2020. Correct, right. yes. Right. Yeah. Two months. Okay. Right. 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 Good. So there'll be notifications about that, and people can attend that. So Definitely. Not to cut you off, but we're okay. down for time here. I want to get everybody in who wants to speak. Right. So. Can I have a quick question? Yes. Um, Just, yeah, supervisor, if I'd like to thank you. So the, <laughs> the reports that have been submitted to DNR need to be approved, so they're not a matter of 
record yet? I mean, are those publicly available? To they you are. Post they, them or uh, it's not like that was the intent, but it might not happen for a while. But people may be interested in seeing those sooner rather than later. Sure. The reports that have been submitted to DNR at this point are publicly available through the DNR website. It's called the BRTS. B R R T S. Um, it's like Bureau of. Some of you probably remember it. I, I didn't know it as BERTS. But if you look up BRRTS on the DNR website, you'll, you'll see. And then um, there's a, um, the ones that we've submitted. Project. The ones we've submitted. Okay. What's right. the project name? Then under the, on the BERTS, you have to type in something. Yeah, that's a fair <coughs> point. You can just look it up by PFOS and it'll be there. Okay. Yeah, yeah. and there's, and just for that, from that point of orientation, you're going to have three bird sites that are going to be relevant to your interest in the airport. There's going to be, the Air National Guard has a bird site. Uh, the, I think Starkweather Creek has a bird site. That's the one that includes this, uh, the county, the city, and Air National Guard. And then the third would be um, the Dane County stormwater system. Okay. That sounds great. Good question. So just to move on, next then I want to have speakers, and um, you can go up to the front and speak. And um, we've got 12 people, so we'll go with three minutes each. And uh, Kyle will be will be timing. And the first person is Michael, and I apologize if I mispronounce your name. Michael Baru. Aaron. Aaron. Sorry. I'm just going to go up to the front. You've got three minutes, so All right. we can stay um, for three minutes, we can get everybody in. I live at 2922 Oak Ridge Avenue, which is one block east of the main flight path, two blocks from Madison Kip, and one third of a mile from the mouth of Starkweather Creek. <coughs> so I'm very interested in this. Several of us uh, took an interest in the Kip situation. Uh, that took hundreds of soil samples, dozens of monitoring wells, uh, and a lot of groundwater modeling to define that problem and make sure it wasn't impacting the city wells. Uh, they didn't wait to see until the levels got up in the wells uh, up to any point. They wanted to stop it right away. Uh, the DNR, is, as was mentioned, is in the early stages of that investigation for this problem. Uh, my issue with them, or my problem with them, is they don't have the ability to do what they did to Kip. They can't just shut them down. They can't find them into submission. They need local government, a landlord that owns the property, to put pressure uh, on the Air Force to deal with this issue, in my opinion. Uh, the federal government is playing chicken. They have not allocated funds for this. They're assuming that the local <coughs> communities will not have the ability to stand up to them. We want all that pork barrel money. Uh, and if Madison, which has a thriving local high-tech economy, cannot stand up to the Air Force, I'm wondering who in the heck is going to do it. So I'm asking you folks uh, to start the ball rolling by recommending to the Board of Supervisors to stand up and make sure this gets done before the Air Force is allowed to bring in a bunch of bulldozers and stir up the mess and make it worse than it already is. So thank you very much. Great. Okay. Thank you. Next person is uh, Robert Moore. And the next person after that will be Carl Lansness. Hi. I'm a toxicologist. Um, did toxicology research for more than 40 years. And there's several things that I think those of you who are making decisions need to appreciate because you're not getting it from the official, uh, most of the official voices that you've been hearing from. One of the principles is that the science is often decades behind the use. Things are out there and it can take researchers many, many years to start to understand what the hazards of the chemicals are. On top, to make it worse, the regulations are often decades behind the science. So what you're seeing is there's 4,700 approximately of these chemicals in this class, and a lot is known, a fair, pretty good amount is known about two of them. The actual, if you follow the, the standard risk assessment and regulatory principles, the allowable level for PFOS would be one part per trillion, not 70 that the EPA currently says, not that apparently Wisconsin is now talking about. Um, so there's, there's, there are real problems. So when 
when people are assuming that, well, we've measured these things and you know these are the levels we have and they meet some official government standard, that is simply not true. That's based on what is, has been discovered so far, kind of, to be generous. But the history shows that the, the more research is done, the more is discovered, very little is known about nearly you know, 4,700 of these. Second point is that given that there's about 4,700 of these, how many are actually being measured? So when you see a report that the total amount of PFAS in this water or fish is whatever, no, that's not true. That's the amount they detected. And as far as I can tell, there's, you can either, so a question is, you know, so of the 4,700, how many are the methods being used capable of detecting? And where the flip side of it is there are ways of approximating the total amounts, so without trying to measure all thousands individually, and without knowing what percent of the total are being measured, you're flying blind, and so that question has to be, in, you know, you have to be aware of that issue. The final point um, is that these chemicals, uh, to a large extent, have a common mechanism of action. They certainly vary in potency from one chemical to another. Um, they all, there's also differences in how they act. And according to the Food Quality Protection Act of 1996, they're supposed to be regu it, me uh, chemicals that are that have a common mechanism of action are supposed to be um, regulated together, safe level set together. And uh, so when you're seeing that we're proposing this or that for one or two chemicals, that's really missing the point. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Carl, you're up next. Carl Lamb, next. Want to go ahead. And then following him will be Jim. Jim, you'll be following. Okay. Uh, I'm Carl Asness. I'm co-chair of Friends of Starkweather Creek, but I'm not speaking for the Friends because we have not reached consensus on our board on this. Um, and yet there's a growing desire amongst our board members to do more listening before jumping to conclusions and, and blaming and demanding and, and so on. And I personally and one of those committed to finding a higher, better, equitable, win-win way of resolving this issue. Uh, despite my background in science and engineering, I do not necessarily align with or agree with the common scientific beliefs about the findings or the solutions. And my current passion, for some of you who are involved in city politics, is conflict resolution. And some of the city committees and council, they know me as the giraffe guy. Because I talk about the language of the heart. Giraffes have the largest heart of any land, land animal. And for an issue like this, where fear is pushing so many conclusions, and we get into the eagle language of the head, I personally believe passionately we need to find a way to speak and more importantly listen with the language of the heart. To find higher ways to honor and respect those people who trigger us. I personally am hugely committed to both the scientific, the cutting edge scientific, new ways of clearing this scientifically, but more importantly the social, interpersonal ways of honoring and respecting each other and really listening. So when and if wanted, I am fully committed personally and as a member, as a co-chair of Friends of Starkweather and a Starkweather native who grew up right by the Kip on Wabisa, played in the creek, and now take kids up the creek in my role as co-chair but I also consider myself an invasive because we two-legged white settlers are the real invasives in this that have created the problems. So what I, one of the solutions I want to propose, not to diminish the seriousness of this, for anyone who needs it, and <laughs> God knows I do, any, these are for anyone who most needs some inner peace. It's darn it. This is, this has kept me up at night, and I'm sure it's kept some of you up at night. 
Thank you. Thank you. Give me gas, anyone? Can we give me gas? Jim. Jim Powell's next. Uh, he'll be followed by Harry Richardson. Hello, folks. I'm with the Midwest Environmental Justice Organization, and 11 years ago, uh, we brought an issue about the need for fish advisory signs along shorelines in Maine County. Some of you were here. Um, and so one of those signs that uh, Doug pointed to that we have to get rid of was a sign that I designed. And so, um, so what we're seeing is fish contamination is getting worse in Lake Winona and Starkweather Creek. And um, as commissioners um, responsible for watershed issues, one thing you could do is look more into um, the fish testing that is going on and perhaps some more comprehensive or protective uh, guidelines. Uh, the DNR tends to set those, but as we've told them, um, testing fish fillets is not really helpful for people who eat whole fish, which is what a tremendous amount of subsistence anglers that we work with. They, uh, they cook them, make them, put them in soups and stews, and so you get a lot more exposure from the total uh, surface area of the fish versus just the fillet. So if they had done that for this testing, pretty sure that the levels would have been a lot higher and probably would have crossed a threshold that they've set that would have said do not eat any fish from Starkweather Creek and perhaps even more restricted than Lake, Lake Monona. And that's something that you all can pursue um, because there's a lot of um, science, as we heard from a toxicologist and some other scientists, um, the way it's portrayed and the way it's done is really key to be protective for the populations that eat uh, a lot of fish. When we've surveyed folks in the past, um, some people eat fish almost every day. Um, and eat lots of fish. So, so these guidelines are going to be protective for a lot of people, and that's where um, your interest can really um, play out. Um, a year and a half ago, uh, we came to the commission to talk about PFAS contamination in Starkweather Creek. And I was looking at my testimony from the NNIC, it's 100% relative to today. So, a year and a half later, we're still asking um, for um, testing in the creek, in the sediments, which still has not been done. At all. There's been some other testing, but sediments, which is really important because it really shows the whole biota and the ecological system, has, there's no been testing been done for that. And the county can do that. They don't have to wait for the DNR to do it. They don't have to wait for the military to do it. They can do it themselves. You can, you can do testing. And so the mechanisms to do that, that's something the commission could help try to figure out exactly how that could happen because more information like that is going to get us closer to the end point of really uh, addressing the contamination. We also would ask for a working group to be created um, for Starkweather Creek because there's so many issues. I mean, PFOS is only the latest. Um, there's all those PCBs, uh, VOCs, other issues are still there. And they have not been addressed at all. And we asked for to consider picking that up in a future uh, agenda item. And unfortunately, that hasn't ha happened. So perhaps maybe now it could. And then um, one last thing. Um, because of its stormwater um, 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 uh, permit holding, you know, it can do a lot of testing, which the tab link is happening now, and we're hoping that the, that kind of information is really shared with the public quickly. Um, March sounds like it's probably an aggressive day, but that would be great if that happened. So thanks. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Gary Richardson. Yeah, I didn't need. I didn't oh, ask to speak. Okay, sorry. Right. I just want you to clean this up before sure. before the. Uh, the Dane County, you know, I, I want the Dane County Airport to clean this up before they bring in these F-35s okay. and make all these changes. This is really ridiculous. Okay. Very all right. Great. So can we turn the slide yeah. off? So it's yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. Please do that. Good <laughs> suggestion. Thanks, Julius. Um, Maria Powell. And then followed by Maria will be Kevin Cunningham. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Maria Powell, and Hi. I am the director of the Midwest Environmental Justice Organization. And my one of my board members, just Jim, just stole my thunder, but that's good because it'll take me less time. These, you can hear me right now. I don't know if there's enough. Um, so yeah, as as Jim just mentioned, uh, well, firstly, some context. We started working with the Truex and Garbo neighborhoods in about 2017 on issues affecting Starkweather Creek. And as part of that project in 27, 2018, summer 2018, we, we came before you, this, this, this commission, and I, Jim uh, Tugang, who was back there, who's our vice president, who just left, who grew up at Trek, <coughs> eating fish his whole life from the creek, and Ida, another one of our members, came here, and we, 
we asked you um, several questions, some of which Jim mentioned, but I'll say again. Um, we asked you to support funding for monitoring and mitigating PFAS and other toxic contaminants in Starkweather Creek, sediments and fish downstream of the airport, to support funding for informing and engaging the public, including the most affected low-income communities along the creek about the contaminants. Uh, we asked you to ask Dane County and Truex Air National Guard officials to organize a public meeting to share and discuss PFAS data with the broader community. We asked that you create a public PFAS or Starkweather Creek Task Force and to put Starkweather Creek and PFAS on another agenda. So that was 19 months ago. Um, at that point, the, the commissioners really didn't know what PFAS was. The notes had a, another spelling. Um, they didn't ask us for more information and they didn't follow up with our request. So here we are 19 months later and we now know that the creek and the fish are really contaminated and we're all really sad about that. Um, but what I really want to highlight now um, is that we know that construction is planned at the Turek ba base um, as soon as a couple months from now and um, soil at, and groundwater at the base are heavily, they're highly contaminated. We know the really high levels in shallow groundwater and soils, and when they dig that up, it's inevitable that the P more PFAS and a lot of other contaminants will slosh right into the creek. Um, the city has stated in its written comments for the environmental impact statement for the F-35s that Truex Air National Guard cannot safely and legally, those are those words, um, begin construction at the site without full characterization of the PFAS contamination. But the city is deferring to DNR to assure that this is done properly. It, however, we're concerned that DNR will not demand the full investigation that's really required and will instead allow a sort of piecemeal partial investigation um, that will not be the full investigation that's needed. You're here. What? You're here. Yes. You're here. Sorry. I'm almost done. In light of that, um, <laughs> I'm going to try to skip some of the things Jim already said. But in light, I would like to resubmit our request from summer 2018, all of them, the same things hold, we need public meetings. But I would also ask you, and, and this is all spelled out in more detail in my written comments, that you ask responsible Dane County officials, airport, um, county board, how they will use their authorities and responsibilities and other strategies available to them to prevent further discharges of PFAS into Starkweather Creek from construction projects, whether they're for F-35s, whether they're for something else, that are planned in coming months, um, at anywhere from now all the way through the next several years. And I would also ask that um, this, this body actually look into what those authorities are and, and write it down and share it with us. And then um, I'll skip the fish ones. Okay. One more thing. Up, quick. One more thing. Um, the, I want you to look. It's in my number one on my sheet. It's, it's really important okay. to find out the status of the county's illicit discharge detection and elimination <laughs> ordinance. That was okay. presented yeah. at the last meeting. Okay. Thank okay. you for listening. Great. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So, Kevin Cunningham has Kevin Cunningham is next, followed by Daniel Lippin. I'll go ahead. Hello, everybody. I'm Kevin Cunningham. A lot of what I was going to say has already been said by everybody else, but uh, a few things that I've been doing researching. I have a background as a chemist. You don't need to know a background of a chemist. As you already know, two of these PFOSs are already bad for you. Regardless of the other 4,000 that haven't been tested yet, you don't even have to worry about those. You've already got two that's doing the damage. Uh, True oil airfield, heavily contaminated in the soil from the foam that the firefighters have been using, and there's really only two ways that we can deal with this. One, they have to stop using the PFAS foam and switch to a PFAS free foam, which has been done by other countries all over the world, and I don't know why the military hasn't started doing it with ours yet. And the other thing to stop further contamination is the county has to put pressure on them. We have to suspend any plans for construction or demolition on the airfield until the full environmental study has been done, the effects are understood, and the entire area has been decontaminated. If that's not done, if that's not done, we're going to be having one fish fry every six months instead of just once a month, and nobody wants that. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Daniel, Daniel Lippin. Sorry if I don't pronounce your name right. Is he here? Daniel. Okay, we'll come back to him. Glenn Mitroff, followed by... There's no name. Anyway, Glenn Mitroff, please. Glenn, not here? Okay, maybe he didn't want to speak. 
wish to register in opposition. Sorry, I can't read. Okay, um, probably other case. Then the other is um, Lance. Did you want to speak? Thank you. Yes. <coughs> Thank you so much for letting us speak and for addressing this really serious, important issue. It's got a lot of us very afraid. Uh, I myself, I was at the DNR myself for 20 years. I've been on the Sustainable Madison Committee for the last eight years. I'm on the Friends of Starkweather Board, and I live fairly close to the creek. I have been in the DNR Water Action Volunteers Program for the last six years, waiting in the West Branch with the highest levels of these PFAS to do sampling and to do monitoring of the water uh, in the DNR program. And so I'm intimately, intimately aware with, what, with this, with this uh, situation. Um, first, just a couple principles. Uh, the, the, the Sustainable Madison program is based on uh, the uh, principles of the natural step. One of them, there's only four, one of them says we make a lot of man-made chemicals we should stop making those and putting them in the environment because we don't even know what they do. This is a very serious situation in that. The other, the other one was brought up by Robert Moore, and that's, and that's the precautionary principle. The precautionary principle tells us that if we don't really know what's going to be, what's going to happen with our exposure with all these chemicals, then we should err on the side of precaution. Very different, very, very serious. Um, site, the site characterization needs to be done in a very full way so that we can understand all over that property where exactly this is and how deep and how deep in the water and how far. It's been traveling four miles, four years, uh, even much worse than the Kip situation, which I live right next to. Um, and so we need to characterize that site. We need to find out how it's moving. Groundwater is very shallow from all the rains we've had. It's shallow all over it right now. And the groundwater is very polluted and it goes right into the stream right from the banks of the stream and the banks of the, of the ditches that are going from the airport right into the stream. We need to characterize how that movement is happening and figure out how to deal with that and shut that, shut that off as much as we can. It's not going to be simple and it's not going to be cheap. It's going to cost millions probably. Uh, when, okay, when the construction starts to happen, they will be digging holes and when you dig a hole there, it fills up with water. Then you have to do what's called dewatering. That dewatering will just be going right into the creek, unless it's polluted, and it has to go through million dollar filtration systems before it gets into the creek. Is that going to happen? Where's the money for all that? Basically, what I'm saying is we need to, you need to, the county needs to, the city needs to call a halt to that possible construction that's happening. And, and that's, right now, we're being told April. And so we need to know that that's not going to happen in April before even the site characterization is done. Yeah. So use the power that you have and the influence that you have very seriously. Ask Mr. Parisi to get strong on this. Be strong with the, with the other people in the, in the county, county uh, board and uh, do what you can because this is an extremely, extremely important issue. I have a lot more to say, but not the time right now, but thank you very much. Great, thank you. Okay, what is the email address? If you didn't get all your comments in, if you want to email us, you can put that up on the screen, please. And please email us. Oh, I'm sorry, I have also had Andrea Ritland for um, available for information, but did not want to speak. I believe also Sally Young. Oh, no. Oh, did you want to speak? Yeah. Okay. I can hear your comments too. Oh, you do? Okay, come on. We've got a few more minutes. Oh, I'm sorry. You're doing great. Don't worry about it. Don't be sorry. <laughs> All right. Yeah, don't be sorry. <laughs> Well, I'm not a scientist or a toxologist, but I loved hearing you guys speak. And um, so much, I'm just a citizen, a concerned citizen. But so much of what I heard is what is, you know, intuitive. I, it's like these things are more serious than we're hearing from uh, the powers that be. And I feel very concerned about that. It seems to me that the county has been very passive about this uh, from the beginning. I've written to Joe Parisi myself and got just a blathering, not very uh, informative letter. Um, and it sounds like, I don't even know exactly how these government agencies work, but it sounds like you guys can talk to the county 
and um, maybe light a fire under them because <laughs> the passivity that, we, I mean, we're just not hearing anything. The city has really kind of taken a stand, but it sounds like it's the county that has the power as being the one that leases the airfield to the ANG. So uh, it looks to me like the county is, is what needs to step up. Um, the cautionary principle that was just mentioned, um, I've heard from the environmental working group that one part per trillion is what they recommend, and um, this dithering with, is it 20 or 70 or whatever, it's like, uh, it just doesn't make sense to not go for broke and really tackle this now because it's been happening since the 50s. Why wasn't the county paying attention in the last 50 years to this? Um, we knew about it. Lawsuits happened um, many years ago about PFAS. So why has the county not done anything all these years? And Okay, um, so the one question I had was, are, is anybody paying attention to commercial flights versus the ANG flights? Are they using PFAS? Are they still using PFAS? I haven't heard anything about that. And, um, and then the, the report that's going to come out in March from the lawyer, mid-March, and then what we're hearing is in April ANG is going to start digging. So that's not a very good time frame for taking action after that report comes out. Great. So thank you very much. Sure. I'm sorry to... No, that's okay. Thank no. you. No, thank, thank you very you. much. I work in um, mental health, and um, I did go to the airport commissioner's meeting, and um, we did ask the airport commissioner how much um, kind of yeah power she had over this, and her response was just that um, the military has always owned the land; it's always been the military. She has to basically, you know, um, do whatever the military says. But then on the airport website, it doesn't look like the military has had the land for that long and it looks like it was an airport before that, and then before that it was a cabbage patch. So, <laughs> I don't know. But, um, and then another question I had was just um, how much um, the DNR has changed over the last 15 years, basically with power and things like that. I've just heard different things, and so it's kind of concerning with this coming up, and then just seeing like, how much the DNR can really do and how much they can step up um, and then my last point is that um, the two films that came out, um, the documentary and then the movie with, what's his name, I don't know, Anna Hathaway, but they're both, <laughs> yes, they're both good, yes, and like the whole point of the movie was like, like you pick up the phone and be like, oh, the citizens have to like stand up for this, oh, the citizens have to, and like, that, so that's like kind of the whole point, but if you want a lot of information, I would see both of those and they're good and it's a really dry subject for me, so I feel like I'm learning it. Okay, great. No, terrific. Thank you. Um, then Sharon. And um, if you could give your full name. Sure. I, just, I don't want to mispronounce it. Yep. It's Karen Miskinnon. Oh, Karen. Sorry. Um, and I, I'm not an expert in any means, but there are some people who have done a lot of research on these things, so I'm going to ask the questions that they've researched because um, they're very important ones. The Truax Air National Guard is a tenant and co-permittee on the Dane County stormwater permit, yet the Dane County failed to prevent its tenant from heavily polluting its property and Starkweather Creek with PFAS and many other toxic contaminants. How did this happen? And what, um, what enforcement uh, power do you have as the county? Um, questions for corporate counsel, yep, she's still here. Does the county have no recourse to force its tenant to comply with the law and fully test and remediate pollution on its land? 
Another question, to what extent is the county liable for the pollution that it has allowed on its land for decades and which has polluted the Starkweather Creek? Um, another question, the county <coughs> is the responsible party along with the city and the Air National Guard for pollution on county airport land that goes into Starkweather Creek. Will the county take responsibility for this PFAS pollution and remediate it? Or will it continue to argue that only the military is responsible? As owner of the airport, the county has benefited for decades for contracting out for the firefighting services of the military, as well as the city for some years. How is it not responsible for contamination on its own land? Uh, another question, the county has built a new cell phone parking lot last year at International Lane and Dar Darwin Road over a former burn pit where PFAS contaminating firefighting foam was used. It did not test or remediate the soil it removed and disposed of, disposed of on the northern part of the airport property next to Starkweather Creek. How can the county justify this? Will it test the disposal site at the airport for PFAS? And uh, can the joint operating agreement require that the Air Force clean up its PFAS? Okay, great, thank you. Hi, I'm Matthew Miller. One minute, I live over in Hudson Park. I've been walking down to the Ohio River, Park, uh, River Parkway um, all the time. Did 25 uh, visits d during uh, October, November, December, and I found foam, big, high foam on the shore. Uh, and, and as far as the foam goes, it, it, they may say it looks this and that and the other thing, but the stuff is the foam accumulates junk from the lake, so it's all, it's foam. It's not good foam. Do not think it's good foam. That foam then dissipates and hides on the rocks and the dogs. We have a Teflon lake. Now we're going to have the Iron Man. Remember that? It's going to yeah. be the Teflon Iron Man. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I hate to wrap things up, but um, are we used to assume that the meeting schedule for the commission will be this, the draft schedule that we distributed? Yes. And what is the next meeting date? February 13th, CCB 321 at 5 p.m. Okay, February 13th at, yes. Okay. So the same room? 5 o'clock. 5 o'clock. Okay, all right. Great. And I do know that, um, yeah, I'm not sure. Okay. All right, I'm going to share the second part. So, okay, motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Okay, all in favor. Aye. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.